and then boom it just was like this huge it seemed like this huge crash and you know just water just coming just flowing in and i thought oh i'm screwed you're listening to the adventure sports podcast brought to you by 180 tech we talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there Welcome back to another episode of the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is Travis. On the line with me today is Steve Callahan. Um, if you guys haven't heard of Steve Callahan, this guy uh, is an experienced sailor, a naval architect. He's done a ton in sailing. And back when he was a, a young man, um, he had decided to set out on a, a trip uh, out to over to England and, and then down south to join a race. And Steve found himself uh, off the coast of Africa, uh, floating adrift, and he wrote a book about it. And I want to talk to him today about that and, uh, and let him tell you his story uh, about those 76 days in a life raft on the, on the Atlantic Ocean. So first of all, Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have you. So let's uh, back up a little bit. I kind of alluded to what we're going to be talking about, but um, I also mentioned you being a, a naval architect and having a, quite a bit of a, a sailing experience. So can you do me a favor and go back into your background a little bit and just kind of give us a, a taste of how you got started in sailing and uh, fell in love with it? Yeah, I, I, I well, I started when I was, I don't know, 11 or 12 or something like that. My Boy Scout master actually kind of taught me how to sail. He was kind of my sailing mentor, and I ended up sailing with him for years and years. And um, um, just in from really small boats, basically. I had a lot of a lot of interest. I've always had a lot of interest in small boats. And like Napoleon Solo, this little boat that I built to cross the Atlantic with a small boat. I was inspired by people like. Robert Manry, who sailed Tinkerbell, a 13 and a half foot boat to England when I was a kid, and tales like Contiki and uh, all these adventures, offshore adventures. And I, because I really, I just felt at home kind of once I was on the water. And I seemed to kind of basically understand what sailing was about. But um, anyway, so I just, as I grew up, I was kind of passionate about it. And, um, I don't know, kind of stumbled from one thing to another, really. I started out uh, building boats. I uh, uh, helped my dentist when I was uh, a teenager. It was my, my after-school job was helping him build a, build a 40-foot boat. And then I built a, bo- a, a boat, and then I started helping other people build boats for a while. And uh, then we moved to Maine, my uh, my uh, first wife and I, and uh, up here, I was getting increasingly interested in design, and my father was an architect. I grew up drawing and whatnot, and uh, I got a job here uh, in a design office in a design school, which we built up over the over the years. And uh, I don't know, came 19, I don't know, 79 or so, I built Napoleon Solo, um, which was to be a small, compact cruiser. Um, that could be kind of comfortable if you're willing to get bounced around a little bit in a little boat in the middle of the ocean. And um, sailed it to England with a buddy, and uh, there I, I was – the boat fit the rules for a, a race called a mini transat race, which was limited to small boats. It was supposed to be an alternative to the offshore adventure races like uh, single-handed transatlantic, which were getting you know basically uh, all big boats. And the, and so it was a kind of newish race, and the designs were all really interesting. And so I set off in that, but I had damage on the boat, so dropped out in Spain and then sailed it down to uh, along the coast of Spain and Portugal, out to Madeira and down to the Canaries, and left there January of uh, 1982, and uh, uh, started to cross the Atlantic, the kind of the milk run, what should be the milk run. Uh, you know, if, once you get into the trade winds, you kind of blow over to the Caribbean. And uh, the weather kind of kicked up a little bit. Uh, I wasn't too worried about it because, you know, I'd been on the boat at this point by uh, probably, mm, I don't know, 10 months, something like that. And we'd gone across the ocean. We'd seen gales and whatnot. Um, but it seemed like something hit the boat in the middle of the night and boom, and um, a lot of water came in quickly. And so I bailed out and basically spent the next two and a half months trying to 
adjust, learn to live off the environment. Uh, is basically, I say it's like learning to live like an aquatic caveman, and uh, and eventually drifted west, uh, which took two and a half months, and uh, landed on a little island in the Caribbean called Marie Galant. <laughs> well, here, there goes the whole story of <laughs> 76 <laughs> days of drift. So let's yeah. back up. I mean, obviously, what you just rattled off was a, a, a major uh, life-changing event. So you had built this 21-foot boat to to head over to England and enter into this race. You left uh, Newport, Rhode Island, I think you said in 82, to do That's this. Right. Now, no, 81. I actually left in 81. Okay. When I lost the boat was in early 82. Okay. Yeah, basically, you know, essentially my whole life was kind of falling apart, frankly. You know, I was like, uh, I didn't know what I was doing with business. Like, you know, um, my marriage was going, was basically gone south. We were living apart for a couple of years, and it was like, oh, I'm packing up on this boat and going off and having this adventure. I'd wanted to do, I'd wanted to cross the Atlantic in a small boat, either alone or with somebody else since I was like 12, so... Um, that was the major impetus, and I was really interested. I've always been really interested in really efficient use of space, and boats are a really interesting blend of vehicle and habitat and art all at the same time. So that really all all, all appealed to me. So, you know, it was like chuck everything into this boat and go off and have the adventure. Although it was a little bit more of an adventure than I probably wanted. No doubt. Well, you got to, let's put this into perspective. Um, a twenty-one foot sailboat is a trailerable boat i mean this is something you can pull behind a a you know full-size pickup truck this is not a uh, yeah. an ocean-going vessel as you would you know we would think about it well yes and no yes and no you know actually i i i'm a firm believer in, in this that that survivability at sea has nothing to do with size mm-hmm. not the survivability of the vessel i've i can't tell you how many times i've been in the middle of the ocean and seen things like light bulbs that have been out there for, for years <laughs> in some cases seriously right. and you think they're the most fragile thing in the in the planet but they just get tossed around in the waves if you're in a small boat you'd kind of design that with in mind you know like solo was a keel boat and had watertight compartments in it, which helped to save my ass. and um, was designed with the assumption that she probably would go upside down at some point, which she almost did once. And, you know, so you design it differently. You know, it's more, it was designed as kind of a small ocean going boat. Right, right. So that's why I brought it up. I was uh, I was wondering about the the differences, uh, comparison, contrast, uh, doing it in a twenty one foot boat versus a forty five fifty foot boat. Um, obviously, I, oh, I would it's think... it's really different. <laughs> right, right. It's so really go into different. that a little bit. If I've, you would. I've crossed the Atlantic and everything from um, well half with half in a six foot life raft in in the Napoleon Solo twenty one foot or two like 67 foot steel boat and yeah there's a world of difference but bigger there's a saying also bigger boat bigger problems you know the forces are really huge if something goes wrong and there's like way out of your control so there's a lot of appeal in small boats you're li- but you're living close to the water and you get bounced around a lot right. like there was this guy john letcher who sailed around the world in a 21 footer uh, way before me, and and a, and a lovely little little boat. And you know, I met John once, and he said, "Yeah, yeah, but that's a young man's boat." You know, as he got older, he got bigger boats that are, <laughs> you know, a lot more comfy. They, in a way, but in the the small boats have a lot of appeal because all the forces and stuff are more human sized on the boat, at least. You know, the the oceans. <laughs> you know, you're never going to beat that, but. Um, it, when something goes wrong in the boat, like I got dismasted and I was able to re-rig a mast on the boat mm-hmm. single-handed, which I could never have done on like a 40-foot boat. Yeah, that's just interesting. There's, so there's definitely pros and cons to to having a small boat and doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that kind of appealed to me and also the compact nature of it. It's kind of like backpacking across the ocean. And you're, it's more, a lot of it's about being there, not so much as getting someplace. Right, right. More some simplistic way to do it. That makes sense. I can, I can understand that. So you headed out from Newport, Rhode Island, and you're heading over to England to join this regatta. Um, right. Tell me about that. So when you, you get to New England, or get to England, sorry, I'm from New England. Um, when you get to England and you're going to join the race, how, does, uh, how do the events uh, lay out there, play out there once you get over there? In, in England? Right. Uh, yeah, well, we got into Penzance, um, um, 
in Cornwall, which is a lovely place. Oh, my God, it was just fantastic to be there and to get there. You know, once we'd gotten there, it was like, oh, man, I just, like, finished this childhood dream in a way. <laughs> and um, it was it was great just hanging out there and all the many trans had, other many trans had boats coming in and, you know, all the other skippers, mostly young but some older, like this guy, uh, Brian, who was 50 years old when in the race. But it was incredibly rough. It was um, once we started, it was like it had been forecast for gales. You know, it's North Atlantic and like just gets nailed with all these low pressure systems and stuff. And so we kind of started out in that um, when the race actually started and uh, and kind of beat down the coast. And there was a lot of damage actually even before the race and some of the storms, a French sailor got killed coming across from France, he got smashed into the rocks. And uh, so <laughs> it was all, almost a grim mood. And that, in fact, it, early on in the race, I, um, you know, getting just off the coast of, of France before the Bay of Biscay, I was coming along and there was an Italian boat and I was passing and it didn't look right. It was like the jib was kind of dangling a little bit in the water and whatnot. I keep trying to get him on the radio and I'm yelling across to him. I don't get any response. It turned out later that he was actually below bailing. He was sinking. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, there were, there were two, bo- two or three boats lost and a lot of people had damage, including myself. So we, I put into Spain, in, into La Coruña. So there's a whole little gathering of us, of us there, wait, and then waited for weeks to get something other than gale conditions to get out of the Bay of Biscay and on our way again. <laughs> wow. So this whole, uh, this whole regatta had a kind of an ominous cloud over it, it sounds like, from the beginning. It did. There were a lot of dropouts in it. It was a tough year. You know, once you get south, you know, it's tough at the beginning like that. And then the idea is, you know, well, then you get south, you get to the, uh, finally out to the Canary Islands, which are off the co- basically off the African coast and stretch out quite a ways into the Atlantic. And then you get a downwind leg home. You get, you get kind of the candy at the, at the end of it, you know, for, for that leg, supposedly. That should, that should be the easier leg. But the, it can be pretty brutal at the beginning. Yeah, sounds like it. Okay, so you're over here, you're 29 years old, you're solo sailing this 21-foot boat. Um, eventually, you get knocked out of the race, and um, I assume you get your repairs done, and you're going to head back home at this point, right? Right. Yeah, I'm broke. Um, I got everything I have pretty much is in the boat, other than a rusty old ancient pickup truck and a few tools at home, but um, pretty much everything's in the boat, and... I'm assuming I'm going to sail across and probably go up to St. Croix where I have a uh, a buddy, a new buddy I met in Newport before I left, who is sort of creating a boatyard down there and has since operated a boatyard down there building um, multi-hull catamarans primarily, but all kinds, all kinds of vessels. And so at the time I thought, oh, I'll go there and hang out and probably work in the boatyard and a few earn a few dollars and then see what happened from there. Okay. So now you're sailing, you're heading west across the Atlantic again, and Mm -hmm. let's slow down and and go into some more of the detail about how this all happened. What were your feelings um, during it? So you're roughly eight, 800 or a thousand miles off of the, the shore of Africa when you wake up to water. So let's, let's go into that. Yeah, actually, I'm almost in the middle of the Atlantic because, like I say, the Canaries stretch way out, and I left from one of the western ones. I was about 800 miles west of there, so that put okay. me way out in the uh, in the ocean. But um, it still was like another 2,000 miles, 1,800 nautical miles to the Caribbean. It was a long way away. Okay, so what was your first indication something was going wrong? Oh, it was just kind of immediate, you know, I was kind of, you know, I had a, a beautiful week of sailing, actually, it was just like going downwind, and I had the autopilot was working for a change, and, um, uh, you know, I was like reading and exercising and listening to music, and everything was cool, and then it started blowing up pretty hard, um, and so I was kind of reaching across these waves, you know, and they're on the, so the wind and the waves are kind of on the side of the boat, but kind of going down as well because you don't want to get side swiped by these by these waves and they were building up probably to about 
oh, I don't know, maybe maybe a few meters, you know, nine feet, which means you get bigger ones every once in a while and some smaller ones and whatnot, but a lot of breakers. And, and, and so I was looking around the boat, making sure everything was cool, and I had just really short sail up, just enough to keep to kind of keep the boat going, like four or five knots, kind of comfortably and in control. And um, I kept getting up and making sure everything was okay, everything looked cool, and kept laying down and then getting up and laying down. So, I was, And I was tired of laying down with my clothes on, so stupidly, of course, I took, I took almost all of them off, everything but my T-shirt. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and, then, and then, boom, it just was like this huge, it seemed like this huge crash, and, you know, just water just coming, just flowing in, and I thought, oh, I'm screwed. And... You know, I, in early stages of survival, generally, um, there there's so much going on, and you kind of – I became very aware that we're not single-dimensional. We're thinking a lot of things and feeling a lot of things at the same time. I mean, part of me was totally petrified. Part of me was feeling completely doomed. Part of me was, like, feeling like, you idiot for even being here. Um there was part of me that was amused once I got on deck that the camera had come on and was taking this really dramatic footage of this idiot in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> and uh, uh, But through it all, you know, kind of focusing on on the stuff that I needed to do, on, you know, getting my knife out, trying to get my survival gear, I thought the boat was going to go down like a rock. And it did start that way. It just, like, stopped, and just, like, the whole front of the boat was, like, totally full of water. And I don't know. It's hard to judge time in those early stages of survival, but I figured, like, in a minute anyway, the boat was pretty much – the nose was completely underwater. And, you know, so I I left – I actually left my survival bag below because I thought it was going down so quickly. So I got up on the deck, and I got the life raft organized which wasn't easy because by this time the boats were like really low in the water and all the waves are like sweeping across it and you know it's sort of a d- disaster piece theater and um so um got the life raft off and jumped in it thinking if the boat went right down then i was you know i could let go and at least i had the raft and um but i didn't want to let go then i had it well secured to the boat and uh And it became obvious that although the entire, sort of the whole front half of the boat was totally underwater, sort of nosing down, the back half had had with the watertight compartments also developed an air pocket, and it was enough to keep the back kind of afloat when it wasn't underwater with passing waves. So then I could get, so I pulled up the side and dove back inside, you know, getting the survival gear was like really critical. And I had other packages of food and stuff um that i wanted to get to but the priority was first of all the survival kit and then after that um uh uh, whatever else my hands found which included a cushion and stuff but i'm wrestling all this stuff in the boat into this up on the deck and into the raft and trying to stay on the boat get waves washing over it and whatnot and uh, after I get the basic kit and, you know, this cushion and a, a sleeping bag, um, I'm exha- totally exhausted. And I'm also cut up a little bit and this and that from <laughs> some little accidents. And uh, <clears throat> so I decide to kind of stand off from the boat. But the boat full of water is like a super sea anchor, and the raft is really light. It's kind of bobbling around on the water. So all these, if, when, it, when it gets hit by breaking waves, it's kind of like being in an auto accident. And, uh, and the whole raft kind of folds up on you, and water's pouring in. And I got everything tied into the raft at this point. And I was worried, though, it might get torn apart. And after a while, just before dawn, um, there was a big, you know, big wave hit the raft, and then it seemed like kind of peaceful, relatively peaceful, anyway. And uh, so I looked out and uh, saw that I was drifting away from the boat. That you know, the painter I had to the uh, to the to the boat had something parted in the system, what I tied it to, or something had come off. And so I was drifting downwind pretty fast from the boat, which at this point was kind of laying on its side and, yeah, really about two-thirds underwater. I knew it it was only a matter of time before it was probably going to go down. So it was kind of a mixed blessing because had I been able to stay with the boat, 
I might have been able to get, you know, really critical amounts of water and jugs and uh, stuff like that. But um, the fact that the raft hadn't torn apart was pretty lucky, too. So there right. I was, you know, basically next stop was downwind and down current, the same place as I was heading really with a boat, uh, but it was 1,800 nautical miles away. Let's talk about your your ditch kit that you had left on board and had to go back to get. You had some trouble getting that, right? I mean, to to paint the picture, you had to dive back down underwater to go cut this ditch right. kit away from the boat. Yeah, right? in so the dark, is... I couldn't I couldn't see anything. It was all by braille, you know, just down there, kind of feeling around stuff. So, so you 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 leave a sinking boat for the safety of a life raft, yet you realize that you're not going to survive, you know, but a day or or two without your ditch kit. So you have to make the decision to dive back down under the sinking boat, not knowing if it's not going to drop down, like you said, you know, to the bottom of the the ocean. You have right. to, to do yeah, it. Yeah, I was never away. sure either. You know, a wave like I I came up once with some stuff, and you know, this wave had slammed the the hatch shut and all all there was was like water over the top of the whole boat and it was like well maybe this is it maybe it's going down but then the wave went by and i was able to get the hatch open again and get out of there so was that just a moment of utter panic or it was just kind of this kind of, yeah a little a little moment of panic wow. <laughs> With within sort of a, a genre of panic of the moment you know it was uh yeah, it was pretty, it was all pretty, you know, obviously it was pretty scary and um uh, but I was fortunate to get out. And I was fortunate in the trip there was, you know, like in a drift in in the book that I wrote, I tried to bring that out cuz I was became starkly aware of how everything is, you know, a two-sided uh, coin or uh, a two-edged sword and um you know, I was really in a way unfortunate that I didn't have somebody with me, but I was also very very fortunate because there's probably really highly likelihood that at least one of us, if not both of us, would have died if I'd been with somebody else. Right, right, sure. So now you have your ditch kit, and obviously this becomes, it's got to be the most important thing in your life at this point that you have this. So let's go into what was in it um, that would aid you in survival. I mean, this is, in hindsight, you're, you're probably thinking, I should have done this or this or this, but you have this ditch kit, so what's in it? What do you have in your life rep with you? I was actually pretty prepared. You know, I'd been working in the trade, you know, doing boat deliveries. And I had a lot of friends who were like, you know, kind of professional. They were all professional sailors, you know, and or in profession professionals in the trade. And so I knew people who had been on the edge before. I was very cognizant that bad things can really bad things can happen so i had like i had a six-person life raft and the raft the raft had some gear in it um including water uh, cans of water which were really important including two solar stills which were packed into the raft itself <clears throat> and they would basically provide me with you know almost all of my drinking water because i had very little rain um there were uh in my own kit um one of the most fortunate things i had was a little shorty spear gun which i'd bought in the canary islands figuring oh i'll get to the caribbean and do a little spear fishing but it was you know it was like the micro version of a spear gun it was really small but in solo everywhere i put it was like a nuisance it was you know, i hit my head on it or something and finally i said mm-hmm. oh maybe this will just fit in the bag which it just did caddy corner so i was really lucky to have that wow and all kinds of you know basic stuff like knives uh eighth inch cutting board um um all kinds of twine string and basically everything becomes important an important resource yeah you're in that environment you know the most unexpected things become uh really important like um there was a lifeboat survivor I interviewed from the Second World War, and the captain of the boat needed a, a navigational instrument, and so he used a piece of biscuit paper because he fold he knew it was you know you fold it in half and you got two forty five degree angles, you fold it in half again and it's twenty two and a quarter, and they were navigating using the biscuit paper, you know, so everything can become a resource. <laughs> that's that's good to know that kind of stuff so back to this spear gun this was not part of your original survival or ditch kit this was something you picked up kind of at the last minute just to to go uh do some hobby fishing with yeah basically wow yeah so in this ditch kit how many days of of rations 
do you think you had? Oh, not a lot. I only, you know, like I just had uh, some some peanuts and a couple, uh, a few cans of stuff, but they got blown, you know, like beans and things like that, and they got blown. I was too afraid to eat them. I was like, oh, here's poison. So I, I threw them before I even thought had a second thought about it. Mm. And uh, I just stuff I grabbed. I had bags of food in the boat ready to go out, very you know, sort of quick release things. But I never got them. And they they were sort of a separate. They would have been a separate sort of ditch kit, if you will, had I gotten them. So I didn't really have much food. I had like uh, I don't know a half a cabbage that floated out the cabin, a few eggs which lasted about ten seconds before they were dashed. And uh, and stuff like that. So I didn't have a lot. Just some peanuts, some raisins. I think not 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 much. It, food's not as critical, and I was aware of that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's it waters waters the the primary problem. First of all, a loss of body heat, which is a problem. It was cold for me. It was really hard staying warm at night, especially, and because you I was wet probably 50 percent of the time of the trip. And especially in the early days, because it basically blew a gale for three days. By now, you certainly know who Bent Gate is. That's for a great reason. Bent Gate Mountaineering has been sponsoring the Adventure Sports Podcast almost from the beginning, and we really appreciate that. They've made it possible for all the great shows to continue coming your way. We want to say thanks by reminding you to go to them for your backcountry gear. If you live in Colorado, then just stop by their store in Golden. If not, go to bentgate.com. They have what you need from the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics for climbing, hiking, and camping, like Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice? They have you covered there, too. Their staff are passionate adventurers who can offer help from their own experiences. Bentgate also hosts lots of events and speakers. Check out their website to see the schedule and to see all of their products. Help take care of the Adventure Sports Podcast by getting your gear from Bentgate Mountaineering. So, out in the middle of the ocean, you don't normally hit things. You might bump a bump up against some debris that happens to be floating out there, trash, but it's usually not something that's going to blow a hole in the side of your hull. What? Oh, what no, that's first... not true, actually. That's really not true. There's a lot of stuff floating around in the ocean. I mean, I'm, everybody's now familiar with the Pacific garbage dump, so to speak. But actually, in all the oceans, there's tons of debris. I've, I've run across whole trees, containers, really? parts of broken boats. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there to hit, and as, as well as whale. I think probably the most probably explanation of what happened to me was a whale was just swimming along, minding its own business, and we were both at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he gave me a good bump, and for solo, that was a death blow. Um, and that had happened to me before. I just hit a sperm whale in '79 doing a delivery of a, a racing trimaran down to uh, down to Bermuda. And we had a sperm whale in the middle of the day. You could hardly see it. It's like almost all all submerged, you know. And um, and then there it is, right in front of you. <laughs> and for that for that owner of that boat, that was the second whale he'd hit that summer. Really? Yeah, yeah. So wow. there's there's I got I hit a basking shark in a transatlantic race in '86 too, which is like a 25 foot animal with stopped a 60 foot aluminum racing boat dead, like boom. Yeah, we thought the I thought I thought we'd broken a stay and the mass was going to come flying down, but then it, you know I saw it astern. It was this big lump of fish. Wow! So there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that you can hit out there, and and boats are actually that's it's a very common um, accident for voyagers. Yeah, I had no idea. I'm blown away by the by the the chances of actually hitting something like that. I never would have thought that one. I mean, I would think hitting a whale would be a once in a lifetime event, but it sounds a little more common than that. Yeah, it is. If you do a lot of miles, because you're out, you know, you're in a wilderness, so you know you're run, you're running across a lot of wild animals in their own domain, you know, and uh, 
like porpoise are just like amazing you know they always know exactly where you are and whatnot but you know think about it you're in a, a sailboat which is doesn't create any noise from an engine and i'm reaching across breaking 10 foot waves so i'm not making any noise compared to what the ocean is around me it's a very loud environment offshore especially in in heavy weather oh my god it's you know people think sailing is like um peaceful or something right. rather it'd be like a war zone in terms of noise and whatnot so <laughs> <laughs> okay so you think it's a whale um so now your boat is you know mostly submerged and you're drifting away in your life raft you have to cut that line and, and just let it go what's going through your mind as your your home is basically submerged and you're you're heading away from it into the vast ocean well um it's 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 a really hard part of the you know like the the general survival arc most people's experience in you know getting out of the boat or you know running out of the room that's on fire is kind of an initial stage and if you if you get out of that then especially if it's in an, an extended experience you kind of enter into what survival psychologists sometimes call recoil and it's it's for me i call it disorientation and fear it's like your whole old life is gone totally gone and you're in this other place and no matter how familiar you think you are with it you're you're like in you have no idea how you're going to make a living basically and it ta- it's going to it takes a long time to figure that out so it's it's tough and plus you know in my in my experience anyway and i think it's quite common you you beat yourself up a lot every failure you did i know i i I just like beat the hell out of myself basically you know how stupid could you be and what was your life and yeah you fulfilled these you know childhood goals but what do they mean not really much and um i you know you all your failures uh, come back to haunt you and uh it's it's a really kind of dark time while you're at the same time being challenged on every front just to get through the day basically so um but you know the will to survive is pretty strong i know it is in me so um you just kind of trudge forward and work your way through it and eventually you figure out new systems you you know the, the whole idea is to get to adaptation where you're essentially living off the environment in where it, which can go indefinitely and there there are cases of that you know there's this mexican fisherman who was who drifted across the whole pacific it took him 438 days i saw that he had a he, he had a boat he had a bigger boat than what i had as a as a life raft so he had had some advantages in many ways but he showed you know like people can last a really long time at sea if they can adapt to to being there and they're lucky enough to have a craft that kind of holds together right Right. You eventually just kind of succumb, succumb to the situation and, and realize how you're going to deal with it. And that's that's where you are. That's you just. Yeah. And people it. have gone before, you know, like it was important to me that, you know, I had read all the survival books, you know, the Baileys uh, who were adrift, a couple of, who were adrift in. They had two rafts in the Pacific who were adrift for 119 days. And there was um, uh, Dougal Robertson, who's with a family, a whole family was in a, like a dinghy and a raft thing in the in the Pacific for 38 days, who wrote this, uh, a really, I don't know, a kind of, it was quite an inspirational book in survival literature uh, called Survive the Savage Seas, uh, because it showed how creative he and his family were at making tools and adapting to the environment. It was really quite something, as the Baileys did, as everybody eventually has to. But um, I actually carried a survival manual written by Dougal Robertson, which was incredibly helpful. I probably read it like <laughs> I don't know how many times I read that thing. I probably knew it, you know, verbatim almost, because um, you read the same information over and over. You're desperate for information that'll help you out, you know. Yeah, I bet. And it was actually a good manual. It was it's quite a good manual. So. Um, you know, slowly working through the problems, initially trying to figure out the solar stills, how to get them to work, and, you know, uh, and learn to fish, you know, basically. Right. So let's talk about the solar stills. You had three of them on board, is that right? I had three of them, yes. Okay. And these were not um, new fangled uh, products, right? These were from... No, no, no. <laughs> They were all that they were all that was available at the time for producing fresh water out of seawater, at least theoretically. 
Today we have reverse osmosis pumps where mm-hmm. you can you can in a, in a hand pump uh, pump fresh water out of seawater. And most survival um, rafts and, and, and boats for offshore boats carry things like this. Right. But at the time, only solar stills existed. And there were some designs. These happened to be uh, World War II surplus stills that were produced for flyers in the Second World War. And, you know, you pour, they're like little environments, you know, uh, or, or atmospheres. You pour seawater in the top in a little cup and it drips down to this really really fine little hole um, down onto a black cloth suspended on the inside of a balloon and then uh, when the theoretically when the sun comes out it evaporates the fresh water out of that seawater in the in the black on the inside and it collects con- condenses on the inside of the balloon and kind of rains down into a little collection rim and then into a bag but the problem was that um, they were the directions were to float these things in the water attached to the raft, which was a disaster because a wave would go by and the raft would kind of surge forward a bit, but the balloon being like really light and fluffy and everything just like flying out there and at the end of the tether wind was like a boom right at the end and it was it tore the first one actually and um eventually and and it also was shaking them so hard that all the seawater is being flung out from the from the black cloth into the into the, under the sides of the balloon so i was getting just bags full of seawater so i was like nah that's not going to work but i didn't really understand them so uh, until i cut one up i i decided i was going to they it wasn't doing me any good that way so i was going to kind of see how they worked and figure it out and once once i did i i uh, the second one i just decided to put on the raft itself yeah, but I had to keep the bottom wet because a lot of the seawater has to flush through this cloth that's on the bottom, actually a piece of, of cotton cloth. Because once cotton is wet, it's airtight, but water passes through it. So, um, and eventually they wore out because it was on the raft and chafing and also cotton soaked and dried and soaked and dried eventually kind of rots out. But they would last, the last two would last me most of the trip. And if I was lucky, I could get, you know, kind of a pint of water a day out of them. But it took me, I don't know, 10 days or something to figure that out. Fortunately, I had, you know, I had eight pints of water that I started with, so I was I was really thirsty when I finally got them to work a bit, but um, um, I was okay. I was fine. Yeah. Well, it had to be so disheartening to to have these solar stills and just think this is a potential unlimited source of fresh drinking water, yet for 10 days you couldn't get them to work. And you have to be sitting there thinking the amount of water I do have is surely not going to last me 2,000 miles across the, the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, no, no. It was a critical problem, absolutely critical. If I hadn't gotten them to work, like I said, I had a very little rain, and people talked about, you know, oh, you can sponge off dew in the morning. It was like no freaking dew. It was like once the blow, once the blow went by, it, the air was like really super dry. It seemed like all the time, which was fortunate. See, everything has got its downside, but its upside. The great thing was that when I finally started catching fish, see, I could dry the the fish sticks; they wouldn't go rotten. So I could build up a stock of fish for a long period of time. But you know. The downside was I was going to be probably shorter of water than I was than I would like to be. Yeah, right. Okay, so you're you're looking ahead to you know, potentially two thousand miles of of floating, but you know that you have a a chance of being seen by ships in the shipping lanes that you're coming up upon. So tell me about that. You had a little bit of a uh, hopeful moments and then uh, moments of of despair. Yeah. I mean, I, t- I often tell people that that's, you know, I don't know, you, I don't know where you divide the line between normal life and survival, actually. But if you t- look at extreme circumstances, like in this case, you have highs and you have lows, but they're like super highs and super lows, and they can be really squished together in time so that, you know, you can, you can feel like the king of the world one second and be just like in the depths of despair like five minutes later or vice versa depends on what happens like if you find a solution to a problem like once i figured got that solar still to produce fresh water it was like that is super high and um so i was going but 
about two weeks by the second weekend, um, the ecosystem was really starting to fill in around the raft. Dorado or Mai um, were around the raft pretty much all the time, and I was trying to spear them. And I finally caught a fish, a trigger fish, and and that was really pretty bad actually. But um, I was really hungry by that time, and then um, I caught a Dorado, my first Dorado. And that night, um, I had it all stripped up. I had, you know, food, and I was like, oh, my God, this is, you know, this is so good. It tasted <laughs> so good. And um, uh, I went to uh, – I, I, I dozed off. I could sleep about an hour at a time before getting cramped up and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, there was like this Dorado flapping across the bottom of the, of the raft and then boom like the raft got punched from the bottom and it was a shark that had come up under one of the dorado at night they they would hover all around the raft all all at night and just sort of travel with it and uh and so the shark was going after this dorado but then here's a raft and boom and so he's whacking at the raft and I'm totally freaked out and trying to punch at it with my little spear gun not that it could have done him any damage but and finally I I got I got a couple of good little hits into him and uh but you, it was hard to see him because you know it's in the middle of the night and there but you see the bioluminescence you know this glowing glittering glowing uh in the ocean from plankton and and so when something runs through it, the fish runs through it. You know, you kind of see the outline and these little flashes, little stars. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm poking at it, and finally it goes away. And uh, and so I lie back down again, and another Dorado hits the raft, and I jump up, of course, like immediately. And I look out, and there was a ship. That was the first ship, and that was I think that was fourteen. I think that was fourteen days in, something like that. And and I fired, I had a kind of a really good arsenal of flares between what was in the raft and the ditch kit. I had flares in both of them and guns in both of them. So I uh, signaled it, and I thought it had shifted its course and was coming at me. And it was a really clear night, kind of overcast and, you know, really heavy clouds, but it was like down close to the water. It was like really sharp and clear. And so I'm celebrating and I'm firing another flare and I'm lighting off, you know, as it gets closer, I'm lighting off hand flares and whatnot. And I'm drinking water because I'm like, I'm sure that this ship is going to see me, <laughs> but it just keeps going, you know, it's just like boom, 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 off into the into kind of sunrise. And uh, uh, so that was it. And I was, I was, you know, I had all this fantasy how I just caught this Dorado and I was going to share it with the crew, you know, and all this stuff. And I was like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. So I was pretty disappointed. But I, you know, and I, I, I learned a good lesson because I drank water, precious water, rather than like, you know, kind of saving it. Right. And, um, and I wasted too many flares. And by the end of the voyage, I think I can't remember how many ships passed me by now. I could, I have to go back and look in the book now. Um, but it was a lot, you know, six ships, eight ships, something like that, that I saw, not to mention ones that might have passed me when I, you know, was asleep or something. So there were a lot. And two of them were within probably within a mile. Like that first ship, I could smell a diesel in the air. And, you know, it goes by and you're really? riding, kind of riding the wake. Yeah, yeah. It was probably, it was, I, it was le- way less than a mile, probably half mile, something. And then second one, the second, uh, not, and I think it was the second one actually was the second closest. And it was within a mile in the middle of the day. If somebody had been walking around on the deck, I could have told you, you know, at least the color of their clothes and stuff like that. But. You know, that's that's the reality out there. People aren't looking for you, and it's really hard to see something, even if you know it's there and you're looking for it. Trust me. I've You know, and I've been in big boats, and ships have a hard time seeing you on a big boat sometimes. So, you know, life raft's pretty teeny. Well, like you said, you know, people, even if they were to see you, they don't really see you because they're not expecting something like that right there in front of them. So they're mind tells them it's not there. I mean, we see that in a lot of instances. So you think how crazy yeah. is that a ship could be so close and not see you, but it's the reality. Sometimes your brain tells you something's not there when it, it really is. Yeah. I, th- I think it's for mariners tend to be pretty focused though. If you see something odd, 
you in a, a mariner. I'm telling you, just from experience, we always, you know, your eye goes back to it. Link. Actually, I'm, I used to be really good at at seeing whales. Actually, because there's something like all of a sudden there's like this really subtle something change in the pattern of the water if it's there, like under the surface, and you're always looking at stuff. And I'll tell you, mariners are really good about that. If they see see something that looks like it might be an accident or a raft or something or other, they're there. It's that's the it's the nature of the law of the sea. They're they're pretty on top of it. The problem with the ships is that the crews they have very few crew, and right. there's you know maybe the one guy's on the bridge, but he may be doing other stuff. He may be in the radio room or looking at the chart or whatever, and it only takes a few minutes and they're gone. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's really hard to see things for ships, um, even though they're up high and whatnot. You know, that's why they are, you know, even when you do drills, it's like retrieving people from the water and stuff is really, really difficult. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So you find yourself out the the other side of the, the shipping lanes with no rescue and you still have a, a long way to go because you're you're basically, you don't have a chance at going through shipping lanes um, or a chance at rescue until you get to the to the far side over to the islands, right? Yeah, the shipping lanes aren't like highways exactly, but there are commonly traveled routes. And, of course, the ships vary depending on weather conditions and stuff to save fuel and not get in bad weather and all that kind of stuff. So there are these kind of general roadways, and I had cr- I, I crossed the first one. I can't remember. That probably was like a month or something into the voyage. And But there would also be other shipping, especially like there's all the shipping along the coast and through the Caribbean up to the Florida and stuff like that, and, and occasional ships in other places. But once I got through the shipping, it was pretty clear that I was kind of through the shipping lane. By that time, I had adapted pretty well, actually. Um, you know, I, I had my kind of my little community. I You know, I named the raft Rubber Ducky, and I do <laughs> – I. Basically, you try to normalize life as much as possible right. and cling to routines and whatnot. So I'd get up in the morning, essentially. You know, sun starts coming up. I had um, tables of declination. I navigated, basically, and did some kind of modified yoga exercises. And as the fish would start to be active and whatnot, it gave me a good chance to try to spear a fish. And, you know, I had I had to tend to those solar stills about every 10 or 15 minutes during the day in order to get production. They they were quirky. Each one had kind of its own personality. And so, you know, the day would kind of proceed, and I, w- us- I had to keep the raft pumped up. I, I mean, it was busy, um, or busy enough, although I had spare time and I could write. I had little pads of paper, and I kept a log as any captain would. I tried to look at it as not as the end of a voyage, but a continuation and a more even more humble craft than Napoleon Solo. And, you know, so I'd keep navigational notes, made a speed distance table and, you know, all this all this stuff basically. Tried to make tools, tried to make other solar stills, which were a failure unfortunately. But you know, you tr- you try stuff. You try you're trying to always trying to f- figure out what might go wrong that you have some control over and prevent that. And then hopefully when things go wrong that you can't anticipate, you know, figure out a way of dealing with it. Yeah. And I, 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 I see that, you know, for plus for sheer sake of sanity, keeping your sanity, you've got to normalize the situation and, and keep yourself occupied because, you know, what else do you do on a raft for 12, 13, 14 hours a day? You know, you're not sitting there sleeping the whole time. It's like a castaway, yeah. you know, when he, he makes his uh, volleyball, his Will, his friend Wilson there on the Exactly island. right. Yeah. Exactly right. I think people need, uh, people need, you know, if you look at survivors, and I've, you know, I've done a lot with survivors over the years and, you know, not only read lots of cases, but talked to lots of people and whatnot. And, you know, people are social animals. For, so, you know, like I worked on this movie Life of Pi. And a lot of that was, you know, he needed the tiger. For me, uh, my tiger were the Dorado and developing a relationship with the fish, um, the sort of lo- love-death relationship, unfortunately, for them. But, um, you know, being tuned into the environment and um, they were my company. Um other people, you know, create <laughs> characters or whatever, or they create a Wilson somehow. Right. That that part of that movie actually really rang true to me. I I, I thought that was a brilliant 
invention of the Wilson character. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. But anyway, so I had the Dorado. They were my they were kind of my company. If you want to try backpacking but you don't really know where to start, I would suggest going to campcrate.net. They can help you find an itinerary and rent you the gear that you need. They'll ship it to your house or anywhere else in the U.S. You use the gear. When you're done, put it back in the box. Put their included pre-printed return label on the outside. Ship it back. Campcrate. Rent. Explore. Return. So the Dorito, it's it's... Neat to see that they actually hung around the life raft. I wouldn't have expected that. I would have thought out in the middle of the Atlantic, there is no way something's going to come by and give you a chance to spear it. But they were hanging out. They were traveling with you, like you said. Yeah, every I I try to explain it this way. Everything that floats in the ocean is like a little island, and it develops an island ecology eventually. You can have like a piece of rope or a light bulb or all kinds of things that float for a while. And, you know, weeds will start growing on that, barnacles will grow, and fish will congregate under it. Mm. You know, I've seen like a little piece of styrofoam with a big fish parked under it. You know, and we sail by and like pick up the styrofoam and the fish starts darting around like, what? who, who took my house? <laughs> you know? And I, the Wilson. Dorado I found were social <laughs> animals, and I it, the, so the school would gather, and by the end of it, I'd have probably fifty fish or something like all around the raft, and they would, you know, they had their own routines. I got to know the fish really intimately, and their patterns. Each one, they they had individual personality. They seemed to hunt in male female pairs. They, you know, I just was fascinated by these amazingly elegant creatures out there, and. Then they would hover around the raft all night, which is unbelievably beautiful because, like I say, everything's like bioluminescence. Anything passing through the water, it just kind of glitters and glows. And so I'd look out, and there would be like, you know, all around uh, these like glowing silver platters under the ocean and stuff. So a lot of it, it was, they were incredibly beautiful. So, you know, it was always that mix of things. Um, my wife says, like, one of the key keys to a drift for her is when I wrote in my log, you know, it's a view of heaven from a seat in hell. Mm-hmm. And that was what that period of the voyage was. Once I had, in a way, it was, it was not pleasant. I had, you know, hundreds of saltwater sores, which were incre- really getting increasingly painful. I had, you know, I was thirsty all the time. I was starving. You know, it wasn't a fun trip. But there were also these real highs in it, or like it, like I say, you know, fixing the solar still, or you know, the the Dorado would break the spear, and every time I'd figure out how to fix it again, you know, that was like a little triumph and whatnot. So it was a very mixed experience. But that, and I, and once I got to day 38, I kind of had a little party for me. I actually drank a pint of water. Usually, I'd just take a little sip and kind of get absorbed, but. I, you know, I drank a pint of water because that was Dua Robertson, you know, with his family. It spent 38 days. So at the beginning, it's like you you always think there's no frigging way I'm ever going to get get through this. And that's almost universal in survivors. And the, the initial stages are really tough because it's like I don't know if I have the strength to figure this out and, you know, withstand it. Right. But uh, slowly you do, you know, you figure things out and you adapt. And um so I was in that stage on day 38, but a few days later, the Dorados broke, broke the spear and put a big hole in the bottom of the raft, and, and then I was like in for a 10-day really heavy-duty drama that really beat me up really badly, and I almost, <laughs> I almost didn't make it out of that, out of that. Um, but I finally figured out a solution, and that kind of entered a, a last stage of the voyage of just sort of hanging on day by day because it just got increasingly difficult. Man, what an intense roller coaster this is. I mean, like you say, you have moments of celebration and, and viewing heaven from a seat in hell, and things are going great. You got Dorado, they're hanging out with you, and you can kill them and eat them, so you got your food, you got your solar uh, solar stills making your water for you, and then the next thing you turn around, you spear a Dorado, you end up slashing the side of your raft, and then you're thinking... I'm done. You know, this is, forget the the view of heaven. There's no way I can get rescued if my life raft goes down. So now you have to deal with this, this turmoil of trying to fix this repair. And man, the emotional roller coaster has got to be insane. 
Yeah, really, it is. It is it, that it, it is insane. It's crazy. It's like you know. Sometimes I I use the metaphor. You know, you're you're like on this knife edge the entire time, but you're over a canyon and you don't dare like get off it. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. It's 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 very intense, obviously, and uh, but um, you know, again, if you just kind of t- try to keep taking one step forward and sometimes you take a couple steps back but there are all kinds of strategies that you employ you know i mean i think i was you know pretty competent as a survivor overall i used a lot of of successful survival strategies of many survivors like you know you have the end goal in sight but you don't obsess about that you obsess about the details that you need to deal with short term that could have long-term bad consequences you know, you forget about your your wants and you concentrate totally on need, absolute need. And you do things like, um, oh, I don't know, you get creative with stuff. You know, it's, you know, the, the the movie Apollo 13 has a great line when, you know, engineers are kept saying things like, oh, well, it wasn't designed to do this. It wasn't designed to do that. And the, 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 the head of the um, the operation basically says, I don't care what it was designed to do. I want to know what it can do. And that's what survivors do routinely. You know, they use credit cards to signal airplanes and all kinds of weird stuff. So, you know, I had quite a few tools and raw materials and set about doing stuff. But it was really when the bottom of the raft went, it was like I really didn't think I would get through that. The top was still afloat. I wasn't like I was going to sink, but – it's kind of difficult to explain, but because there was like this big bubble of quick, you know, kind of quicksand in the middle of the raft, you know, of of rubber. And, um, I, it, there was only like a couple of inches of freeboard. So any waves that were coming by, you know, there's a lot of water sloshing in and out and made it really hard to deal with the solar still and impossible to fish. And so it was really critical. I, I, figure that one out but that's when another person would have been a real help because i think they could have helped me figure out the solution before i did and it took me a while but in, and in the end it was one of those things where it was a handle to a fork that i could employ as a pin to lash this you know this thing up with it was the only thing that worked and once it did work see that was a huge huge high because i was really i was so close to just laying down and meeting the end and when it kind of occurred to me that I could use this pen and f- make this fix and when it was fixed it actually held held air better than the top tube and so that was like this super high uh one of the biggest highs of my life actually just like this stupid little you know tied together patch of of a rubber raft but it it worked well and so then but it by that time I, my body was pretty beaten up uh I was exhausted I had a lot of kind of wounds chafe wounds and whatnot and uh, I, I was just like really beat. And by then I was close to the Caribbean. So the problem wasn't cold at night so much. It was staying cool enough during the day. Cause it was like baking. It was what I called the afternoon bake off and I had to tend to the solar still. So I couldn't doze off or anything like that. It was really pretty brutal, but eventually each day would get towards the end and the sun would go down. And I, you know, I've got this canopy on the top of the raft, like a tent, but there's an opening to it sort of triangular opening and um i I thought about it as my picture window and i'd sit down and i'd have you know whatever i had to eat and a swallow of water or whatnot and try to get some rest and get up the next day and do it all over again and eventually thinking i'm going to get to the caribbean i'm and i'm navigating i'm i i got my latitude pretty well figured out because i make the sextant out of pencils and measure the north star and so i i know more or less my latitude but i'm worried i'm going to get carried by the current up away above the the islands of the caribbean and get swept up in the gulf stream next stop england and I, you know that's that wouldn't have been good at all so i'm trying to coax my drift south a little bit by dragging you know i had this rope out the back that had a pole on it that increased my visibility and I grow barnacles on it and used it as a speedometer and whatnot. I could park that on one side of the raft to kind of encourage the drift a very, very little bit south. And But I didn't know if my navigation was good at all because I kept expecting to see the islands. But then I eventually I started seeing, you know, signs, changes. Like um, I went through this 
period of drifting through. I called it the road of trash. It was mostly weed, but all kinds of human refuse too. Uh, bottles and cans and crates and you know all kinds of stuff a tire you know all that kind of junk just stretched out from horizon to horizon I kind of drifted through this pier- the, these strings of this stuff and whatnot for a while and birds started showing up uh, different birds like terns and stuff like that so I knew I was I should be getting close but I really had no idea because I was a little optimistic and how far I thought I'd gone west, and I, I thought I should be seeing islands, and they weren't there. But it was just hanging in day by day until it finally happened. Right, right. Well, you mentioned the the rope and the pole. Um, you and being able to use that as a speedometer. I read mm-hmm. that, and I was actually, you know, in these moments, obviously, I can sit here comfortably in a in a computer chair and talk to you on a microphone, and you don't think you'd ever come up with something like that. Um, but that was pretty pretty impressive. To, to see that you had used something like that to do some of your navigation. I mean, we can navigate by, you know, celestial means, but to use to figure out how fast across the ocean we're traveling in a life raft, how do you do that? And you did this with a, a rope and pole, so explain that a little bit. Yeah, okay, well, the I can't remember how many feet it was, you know, 70 feet or something like that. And so I made up a little speed distance table, you know, how many seconds it goes for that 70 feet and you know you work back from from miles and so i knew if something floated by like a piece of weed and it took you know 12 seconds to get to the pole i was going like half a knot which would be (laughs) fast on the raft or i could tell if it was going kind of quarter knot it wasn't perfect but you know that's really kind of the almost i I reverted like everything else to uh primitive systems right called primitive systems but you know, you get tuned into the environment. That's how people navigated for years and years. It was very difficult to tell longitude until the invention of the chronometer because you need time difference where the stars move across the Earth. But if if you – the North Pole, if you're standing on the North Pole, the North Star is basically 90 degrees of the horizon. You're at 90 degrees latitude. And if you're on the on the equator, it's basically bouncing on horizon zero degrees. So it just works out that, you know – Every every degree up is is a degree, so I could measure that. And um, but in terms of the miles, sorry, I got kind of lost. And that that was for the sextant. In the the miles, you me, you just make the speed distance table and say, okay, a piece of weed's going back there, and I'm going a quarter knot. Plus, I had a chart which had um, uh, average uh, current. Which probably was a little inaccurate. I've found pilot charts are based on ship information over long periods of time, and they're generally right, but there are a lot of exceptions. So, you know, I kind of had an idea how fast I was going. But like basically, a, good, a decent day was 25 miles, and I just marked that off on the chart till work my way, work my way west. Yeah, that's neat. And at night, you know, you have the north, you have all kinds of stars up there, so you kind of know what direction you're going in. Right. Right. Okay, so day after day, you're floating on this raft across the Atlantic Ocean, and you know many days they they have their ups and downs. But eventually, one day, day seventy six, is your big day. Um, go through that day and describe how what your feelings were when you finally saw some land, and then eventually saw some people. Um, yeah, really, it kind of started on the seventy fifth night because I started seeing lights and I thought they might be ships or by the clustering of them, I thought, well, maybe they're fishing fleets. Like in the Bay of Biscay, you see lots of, you know, clusters of like fishing boats and whatnot. And they seem not to be moving that fast either, which is like fishing boats if they're engaged. So, um, I, I saw these glows, and I, I don't know. So I go to sleep, and for an hour or so, I really couldn't rest that much because I was in a lot of pain, and you know, kind of sore pains and cramps and all this stuff. So I'd get up about every 45 minutes or an hour, and I could, the lights wouldn't move, and they didn't move, and they didn't move. And then I started seeing the loom of the lighthouse, you know, which is a pulse of glow, and and so I knew I thought, oh, that's it, that's definitely land, and by the time the sun rose, I could see actually I was closer to the islands than I thought I would be. It, I was amazed that I hadn't seen them when I, you know, when when it got dark, before it got dark. 
and so I could see like little houses on behind this beach on uh, the south side of the island. Uh, but there were there was a, a reef out outlying the beach quite a ways out, and you know a lot of breakers. You got the whole Atlantic Ocean kind of sweeping across and breaking against that. And the north side of the island was a definite no go because that was all coral cliffs, and it was it was like I'd just be smashed to bits against that. So I started you know, figuring out um, how I might guide myself around, hopefully the south side of the island, if I went across the, the reef, I, would, I was going to wrap myself up in one of the cushion and stuff that I had and just try either try to get her across the reef or preferably guide the, the raft around the side of the island and land on the other side. And I'm sorting things out when I start hearing this engine and uh, these... Um, these West Indian guys are coming out um, in a boat. It's probably Clements is probably about the size of Napoleon Solo, maybe t- you know 20, 25 feet somewhere in there, and with an outboard uh, open boat, and they're they're coming out and they and they see me. I wave to them and they wave back. I've been seen and I was like I was just like staggered that here it is. This is somehow this is all going to end very soon and uh they come up to the raft and i have a hard time understanding them i don't know what they're speaking it turns out to be creole uh, caribbean creole which is french but it's such a dialect it's like almost unrelated i didn't know if it's spanish what it, what it was and uh one of them was speaking english but it was really heavy accent and he basically said, you know, ask me what I'm doing out there. Because you know, they see people go across. Like I said, it's usually the milk run. You're doing that trip. You know, you're in the trade winds. You kind of blow across downwind. And um, so people have gone across in all kinds of things. Some Englishmen went across in some modified barrel once. And <laughs> Frenchmen went across in a beach cat, you know. They were prepared. You know, they were totally prepared to do that. But, um it, you know, they had no idea if I was just like some fruitcake who was in some weird boat or something. But I got it across to them that I'd been shipwrecked and whatnot, and they asked me if I wanted to go into the island. And I don't know, I just kind of burst out. It was just like I was so overjoyed to have them there, and they were, you know, godsend. And here I had these fish, and the fish at this point, I mean, really, they're kind of the – I'm really a clumsy human observer of this amazing environment I went through, and it all center you know the fish kind of represent um a lot of the magic and the mystery of, of the sea because it turns out they were you know they they gave me my sustenance um they became my friends in many cases. I knew a lot of them individually and and in the end, they brought my salvation because as they as as the raft got close to the shore frigate birds came were coming out from the island and they were hovering above the raft because they all feed on what the the dorado do the the flying fish and that's why the, these guys were here but so but i wasn't thinking about all this at the time i just had this amazing feeling i all i had to give these guys were the, these fish that had followed me across the ocean so i told them to fish for a while and uh, they would zoom off and they're catching fish and they're flying under the boat and whatnot and they kept coming by and asked me if there was anything you know they'd ask me if there was anything i i wanted and i said oh jesus man if you if you got any kind of fresh fruit or anything they said no, no, no we don't have any of that and they zoomed off and when they and they came back and they handed me this thing in a uh brown paper wrapped up and I opened it up and it was a coca sucre which is basically just raw sugar uh, in uh, uh, coconut boiled in raw sugar and that thing was just the most amazing thing I think I'll I've bet. ever eaten in my life and uh, so they fished for a while and then it was getting to be the afternoon bake off I was having a harder time as the sun was coming up and getting hot and they could see that so they came by and fish was all loaded up with boat with I mean the boat was all loaded up with fish and they said they'd never gone to that side of the island before either, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, um, they just decided to go on the windward side of the island for the first time ever, and they got the best catch that they had ever had. So I thought I was I was pleased with that. <laughs> but I also felt a bit of a Judas because there I was sitting amongst all the fish that I knew, and it had kept me alive, and you know were amazing beings in their own right. So. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so so you... then we zoomed into the island, and that was that. Wow. So you drift 76 days, thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean. You finally 
reach a human being and you let them go fish. You let them, you let them go. I don't know if I could do that. I mean, I'd probably latch onto those guys and never let go. Yeah, I don't know. A lot of a lot of people seem surprised about that, but I, I, you know, it wasn't. It was a very visceral thing. You know, a lot about the voyage is very visceral. It really teaches you how much of an animal you are. Again, you know, also referenced in, in kind of in, in the life of Pi thing, because there's a lot of that in there about becoming the beast. It, it's living at a very primitive level, and you realize that there's very little separation between oneself and other every animal in the environment you know you, it, it, there's a the sacredness to everything you eat and kill in order to keep yourself alive and i don't know i became really acutely aware of that and and yet we need to eat to survive and there, here were these fish you know and i don't know amazing creatures and i kind of like i often thought about you know they ended up in all these dinner plates and hotels and restaurants and stuff and nobody knew their history you right. know but me but, yeah very interesting but they were kind of spreading their own spirit and that lived on, that's lived on in my life since you know i mean the whole adrift thing and the dorado and whatnot because we brought a lot of that alive when making Life of Pi, you know, the, the whole thing about the environment and the way it, it, it there's, there's like this whole community and you're on this roadway going across the ocean. And um, so it was very interesting that Adrift, the whole experience in the Dorado would bring, you know, this Hollywood director to my door and I'd work on this amazing project. So it, I don't know, the, the vo I guess the voyage never really ends. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. Well, what an amazing story that is uh it just blows me away that you know the the mental survival uh in this whole situation is is achievable you know you think what on earth would I would do would I do for that many months uh just yeah. riding these ups and downs um of emotions you know how how would I survive it but obviously you did and uh it's got a abs obviously it's changed your life um you know from that point on. Uh, yeah, it's nice. led me down all kinds of roads to meet people I would never have met before, you know, coming back, doing the book and doing a lot more writing in, in my life, publishing and uh, film projects and all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, I de definitely my life would not be at all the same. <laughs> um, and it gave me a lot of impetus to come back and kind of fix things that were, you know, the reasons I left uh, the United States to begin with, you know, my life being kind of in shambles and not to being very good with relationships and all kinds of stuff, you know, to come back and kind of rebuild, rebuild a life again. And I find that that's often uh, a commonality with other survivors too. It's not like we want to have that experience again, but we learn so much from them. They become, you know, really big building blocks of our life. So, um, you don't want to go back there, but you don't mind having taken the trip. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. All right, well, if you guys want to go read in detail uh, Steve's story, the book is Adrift, 76 Days Lost at Sea. It's been a New York Times bestseller. Um, I am definitely going to be picking it up myself because I want to get uh, definitely dig, dig in uh, to more detail about this story and, and see what it was like for you day in, day out. So, Steve, thanks so much for spending the time to uh, to tell me and the listeners uh, about your story. I can't wait to read the book. Well, thank you, Travis. I appreciate uh, I appreciate your interest in, I don't know, happy voyaging wherever you end up. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. You take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right. Hey, thank you so much for listening today. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please do tell your friends about us. We want to make sure that we can help share the word, encouraging others and inspiring people to have great adventures and to make a difference in their world. 